Welcome to the Fermented Homestead. If you're new here, my name is Anna, and on this channel, I like to share our journey of learning how to turn our home into a homestead. Today is fermenting day. I am just about to ferment so many different things, it's just, it makes my mind boggle a little bit. I had to write it all down. So we've got water kefir, kombucha, sweet potato fly, ginger bug. I might try fermenting ginger, I haven't decided yet. Uh, sweet potatoes with uh, like jalapenos in it red onions, jalapenos, asparagus, and applesauce. So we're gonna see how much of this we can actually get through and I will show you all along the step, along the way, every step along the way. That's what I'm trying to say, every step along the way. So we'll see, we'll see you in just a bit and we're gonna get started on the kombucha. So this is by no means a kombucha tutorial or any other kind of a tutorial. This is just vlog style falling around for the whole day. It's 2.30 right now and just getting started. We're gonna see how many of these ferments we can actually do. And if you're interested in actually how I'm doing each thing in a little bit more detail, I'm gonna post uh, different, there are different, I guess, tutorials on how I'm doing all of these different ferments and they'll be more in detail and just more hands-on, I guess you would call it. So uh, if you're interested in that, I'm gonna try and link as many of those videos as I can once they actually get posted, but this one's definitely gonna be posted long before the other ones are. So stay tuned and they're coming. So while we're waiting for the kombucha to finish its steeping, we're gonna go ahead and finish up this kefir really quick. Shouldn't take long, so let's do it. So with the, the kefir, I just saved have saved all these old bottles from like kombucha and kefir that I've bought over the years, and I just repurposed them. Well, repurpose? It's not really. It's a new, new purpose, but reuse them until they kind of just stop working. <laughs> Oftentimes like the, the seal that's on the inside of the lids, this thing that's in there, that'll fall out and kind of just makes the lid useless. But the jars themselves just kind of last forever. And so all I have to do with them is I like to use these ones instead of the flip top bottles because these ones I can put fruit in them. And the flip top bottles, you can't really use dried fruit and which we get this and a tremendous amount of other dried fruits throughout the year uh, well fruits that I dry throughout the year that we get for free so this just makes the most sense for this particular drink and since we go through we use these way more often my husband and I probably each have two of these every day off and on sometimes a little more sometimes a little less but average about two and so it's nice when you can use free stuff for it the juice I have to use with the kombucha uh, and I'll show you that here in a little bit, but this works out perfectly. And I have so many dried apples. You have no idea if you saw that in there pretty recently. I don't remember which one that was, but recently you saw me drying out all these. There's still more under there that I haven't gotten to, probably maybe a half of a can of, a half of, of a dehydrator load full. So yeah, enough blabbing. You can throw these away, you can do, you know, you can, you're supposed to sift through them. I just tend to, when I pour it off, all this stuff is in the bottom, except some that's floating on the top and in the middle. And I just pour the first one really quick and whatever is in the strainer, I throw it away because I figure that's probably, you know, probably not the best of the grains because they're floating. And then whatever else is left over, I just kind of re reuse it and reuse it. And I probably could get a better product if I actually lessened the amount of grains that are in there, but I haven't. I'll let you know when I do. Anytime that I'm filtering out the kefir grains, I always like to make sure that I rinse off, the, rinse out the jar. I've just had a lot more luck with that. I've, I, if you have any little kefir grains that are left inside the jar and then you add the hot water to it, it kills them right away. And then I've, I've read in a few different places that, that, you know, when you kill the grains and you leave them in the jar, it can kind of contaminate the rest of the batch. So I always like to just make sure that I'm rinsing it out as, you know, not anything insane, but just making sure that I get anything that I can see out of the jar before I put the hot water in. They're 
in. Okay, so now we're just waiting for this to kind of slowly dissolve. And then we're gonna do the same thing over here with the, the uh, kombucha, if I can talk. All right. One ferment checked off the list. I wanted to kind of mention here, since I'm doing so many different types of, of ferments, if you are new to ferments and you're just getting started or you have a few different things that are going, maybe you have some kefir and then water kefir and you have some, uh, I don't know, vegetable ferments or something like that. And you wanna make sure that you're not storing them right next to each other. Especially anything like kombucha is gonna be very overpowering to any other ferments because it's just so, so strong yeast and all that kind of stuff. So you wanna keep kombucha separate from like water kefir, separate from like milk kefir, separate from like any kind of vegetable ferments and things like that. Just different types of bacteria and yeasts you wanna keep separate. You wanna keep them. I've been told different numbers, but I generally tend to stick with the eight foot rule. I have my kombucha is right, or my kefir is right over there behind you. And then just right here behind the coffee pot on the other side of the wall is where I keep my kombucha. And then over there is where I keep uh, any vegetable for, or fruit ferments or anything like that that I may have. Uh, Cause I can't keep them actually in the living room cause it gets too hot in there and it'll mold. So I've just kind of found the places in my own home with the number of ferments that I tend to have. I just kind of have their own little areas. And so I just want to throw that in there. Just make sure you keep your ferments separate. Uh, you can keep similar ferments. Like you can keep like pickle, like pickling cucumbers and you can keep like asparagus. You can keep those ones together. That's not going to matter because it's pretty much the same bacteria. It's just totally different types of ferments. You want to make sure that you're keeping separate. So next up on the fermenting list of things that we're going to get done today is going to be a ginger bug. And I have tried making ginger bugs several times actually in the past and I have never had any luck. The first time I tried to do it, it just would not ferment. It would not, I was using organic stuff. I was doing it exactly the, by the book and for whatever reason, it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't actually like develop what you're looking for. Basically the white uh, foamy stuff on top and it just wouldn't do what it was supposed to do. So after like, I don't even know, it had to been like a month. I just threw it out and after a little while, I tried again, started it again. And then that was right around the time that I was moving. So that just did not happen. And I didn't tend to it. I didn't do what I was supposed to do with it. So round number three, we're gonna go ahead and try and finish up this um, ginger bug. <laughs> okay, so, and I'm also gonna try it a different way. I'm going to try making this ginger bug kind of more bulk batch style. And I'm also going to try using it with just standard, this kind of sugar. I've heard that that can make it ferment better. I don't know. I used to, I was using the Costco organic sugar the time before, and I just come across certain people or some people who had mentioned that using just regular white sugar, um, not like GMO sugar, but just good sugar not good sugar, cane sugar, cane sugar. Um, using just regular white cane sugar can be very beneficial in trying to develop a ginger bug. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on that and do it slightly different so we can hopefully get a better result this time. Ginger bug time. So all I'm gonna do with the, all I'm gonna do with the ginger bug is I'm going to grate up freshly two, not two, a quarter of a cup of ginger, and then I'm gonna add a quarter of a cup of the sugar. And then after that, I'm gonna add a bunch of water and we're just gonna add in one or two tablespoons of ginger and sugar every day for the next couple of days. And we'll just kind of see how it goes. So, but all you're gonna see right now is just this part of it. And I'll show you the end of it next week, hopefully. So I still have some leftover warm water from when we were doing the kefir. Okay, so we got that in there. Let's 
that's really all there is to starting a ginger bug, hopefully. At least that's what the people of the internet tell me. Just a quick little side note, I wanted to check on the fermented cranberries that we did last week. If I can get it to open. I've kind of been peeking in there and it seemed like it was just getting a little moldy. I checked it yesterday! <sighs> So this is what I got here. Got a little bit of mold on top, nothing crazy. I'm gonna take it off. And... All right. So I got. Uh, it was just a couple little mold spores. Not a big deal. With that, you kind of just want to use your own judgment and use your own. I mean, because you're the one who has to eat it. I'm not, I'm fine with it. So it doesn't bother me as long as I can get it off and it's not super set in. It hasn't sunk into the actual food, which happened one time and I, I didn't eat it. That was actually recently with some of the hot sauce that I was making. And I, I never ate it, I threw it away. I, you know, once it actually got in and sank into the actual food, tapped out, not gonna do it. But if there's just a little bit of, you know, mold on top, it's not black, it's not, you know, pink, it was just, a little bit of green mold. I'm not worried about it. That is absolutely a judgment call and you cannot see anything that I'm doing. I'm so sorry. I'm just talking away. Okay, so. We have. Cranberries. I don't even know how I feel about cranberries, let alone fermented cranberries. Let's give it a shot here. Okay. Smells like alcohol. No. I'm gonna try it one more time. It just, it tasted like, um, like orange pith. So hopefully maybe if I can get further in here, maybe the pith smell taste will go away. I don't know. I think definitely if I had used fresher cranberries when I made this, it probably would have been just fine. But I didn't and it's not. So I'm gonna have to thumbs down this one. Glad I didn't bother me trying to make a video out of it other than just vlogging it. Um, so I will try this again next year, but I will actually be on the ball and on the spot with it. I will make sure that I buy fresh cranberries and I will just take it a little bit more seriously and try and either rule it out or make sure if it's good or not. So um, right as of yet, uh, it's no go for me. All right, so next up on the list of the fermented foods that we're doing today is sweet potato fly, uh, also known as sweet potato crevasse. And it is just, it's basically just a, uh, it's a naturally fermented soda is basically what it comes down to. And it has a pretty similar process as a lot of other kinds of naturally fermented sodas, like uh, not like water kefir, but like anything with a ginger bug in it or anything like that, same same principle basically. It's just using bacteria to ferment it and cause it to be bubbly. So um, I have tried this one time before and had absolutely no luck with it whatsoever. It molded and ferment, molded very, very quickly. And I just did not know it would, so I didn't pay that much attention to it. I hid it away in a closet and that was probably one of the last times I hid away a ferment in a closet because uh, it just happened so quickly and by then it had spread to the other ones and it was just not a, not a great experience. So I'm not gonna be doing that one anytime soon. So with this one, we're gonna make sure that we're, uh, with that I'm watching it very, very, clo very, very closely and very carefully and watching the, the top of it and doing all of the things that you're supposed to do with it. And um, so I'm gonna be using this recipe for sweet potato kvass. I'm sure that's probably backwards, but I'm sorry. And it is out of this traditionally fermented foods book by Shannon Stronger. So 
yeah, these sweet potatoes are pretty gone. Hopefully these will actually work. But hey, at least there's gonna be lots of bacteria on them, right? cover them up with with like a cloth or something that has a permeable lid to it so that it can actually breathe and the airflow can go in here and I'm gonna check this every day probably like two times a day and what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna stir it up just to make sure that that no mold will form on the top of it and that's about it <laughs> you just want to stir it just to make sure because I can't I can't you can't close it off and we don't want to add a bunch of salt to it or anything like that so one way to be able to prevent it is with very regular stirring of it so i'm going to make sure that i'm doing that probably morning and evening and just keep it moving so hopefully the mold won't actually take root and form in the kvass mm -hmm. 